Welcome back to Locked In with the Inbic. This week's episode, really, really, really interesting because we are focusing on federal prison penitentiaries. I interview Michael Hall and how he got a 10-year federal prison sentence and how he spent his time going to different federal penitentiaries and medium federal security prisons throughout the United States. In this episode, we dive into his upbringing, the crimes that led him to the 10-year sentence, and how he navigated the federal prison system. Hope you guys sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. And please, please, please do us a favor. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. It helps boost our show and get it out to more people. I'm your host, Ian Bick, and thank you guys again for tuning in to my podcast, Locked In. Michael Hall, welcome to the show, man. <laughs> yes, sir. I love the energy, bro. You're very, you know, for a guy that just did 10 years in prison, you're you're upbeat, you're excited, you know, ready to share your story. That's man, great. I'm like this every day, bro. What was your inspiration for coming on the show today? I got to ask. I, I was watching, I was watching you. I, I watched it. He sent it to me and then I started watching it. Hold on, my bad. Not right now. <laughs> yeah. So he sent me your, um, your Instagram and sent me like your videos and stuff like that. So I started watching and I'm listening to the dude's story. I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah, that's right. That happens. You that's, get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and I was interested. So I'm like, shoot, I would love to come up there and, you know, give me my story. Yeah, I'm glad we can make it happen and, and excited to jump into your story. Um, where are you from? What's your childhood like? I Man, I'm from Neptune, New Jersey. Neptune. Yeah. That sounds like a whole different planet. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. That's what they call it, the planet. Okay. Yeah, I'm from Neptune, New Jersey, man. And, you know, I grew up. Not like most people, but, you know, some people have it hard. Some people have it good. I grew up, like, in between hard, good. You know what I'm saying? It go, be, it go both ways. I can't just say, like, I had it hard my whole life. You know what I'm saying? I made my choices. What did your parents do for work? <clears throat> uh, right now, my mom worked at, like, some eye doctor place. She's, like, a secretary at an eye doctor place. My father in prison. He'd been in jail all the time. While you are growing up, he was in prison. Yeah, he in jail right now. Oh, wow. <laughs> he always was, in jail. Was that hard for you as a kid? Uh, yeah, because I don't got a father. You know what I'm saying? So I got older cousins and stuff like that that's basically misleading me, honestly. What about siblings? Did you have siblings? Yeah. I got older sister. I got three sisters and a brother. Three uh, Older brother or younger? Younger brother. So were you like that kind of like the father figure in the family, the role model? No, because he grew up in Newark. He didn't grow up where I was at, so he never really been too much around me. Like right now, my little brother is 35 years in jail right now. Oh, wow. So the whole, you've come from a family of dads in prison. You end up going to prison Uncles. and brothers. Yeah. Wow. It's regular. That, that's just, and you're calling that regular. That's like a whole it's different sad life. Say. Yeah. Wow. Sad to say. Did you know, like at a young age that your dad was in prison? Was, yeah. That was put on you very early on? Yeah. What are your like thoughts and feelings about that at that, at that point? At that point, I didn't understand it because I was young. I didn't understand why he was going to jail, what he was going to jail for. I just know he would come home, then he'd go back to jail for some years, like five years. He'd come home. I'm like, so I never kind of figured it to like, really, 14, 15, I started figuring out what jail was. Like, I knew what jail was, going to jail, street rules, stuff like that. Like, I started being, oh, what was going on. Were you visiting him as a child in prison? Yeah, I visited him sometimes when he was down base lot. And does that like motivate you to not want to go to prison at that yeah. age or um, was that, that scary? That's the sad part. It wasn't even scary. It was like, it didn't even feel like nothing. It just felt like I was going to see my dad. Wow. So that didn't deter you at all from anything, from the path you were going to follow. Nah, honestly, no. Nah. I'm, I'm just like my father, honestly. It, it just, I'm more not repetitive like him. He goes back to jail. I'm not going back to jail. I don't know. I'm not going back to so you guys barely had a relationship growing up, even with the visits and everything like that? Yeah, we didn't have too much of a relationship till he came home right before I caught my fed case. What kind of uh, crimes was he in prison for? All drugs, every time. And same thing with your brother? No, nah, my brother locked up for a murder um, and like stealing cars, like a lot of car thefts. Wow. Now, the neighborhood you're growing up in, violent, good, what kind of neighborhood is it? It go both ways, but like, because Neptune and Asbury... It goes like, it's like I could step across the street and I'm in Nasbury, but I could step right back across the street and I'm in Neptune. Like, and I grew up in Nasbury. Like, I was raised in the village, Sewell Avenue, all those places, but I went to school in Neptune. 
and then I stayed at my grandma's house in Neptune. Like, so I was always back and forth. So, but Neptune got an up the hill part of it where it's very nice. Where now you won't consider, no, the trenches. They won't consider you in the trenches no more. Was your mom trying to keep you away from the same path that your father took? My mom, honestly, she she raised me a good kid. I ain't gonna lie. I was always a good kid. Like, I've always been a good person. I've never been negative or this type of, like, I don't, I don't just come off as an asshole to everybody. Like, I'm a good-spirited person. When I walk in a room, it's energy every time. And it's always good energy. I don't never give out bad energy. So I get that from my mother. But my mother wasn't fully in my life. I was raised by my grandmother, rest in peace. My grandmother was a very hard person, very hard. And do you think that affected the path you took with your grandmother raising you? Yeah, because my grandma kicked me out at a young age. So that right there would make me go straight to the streets. Now I'm selling drugs in front of corner stores. I'm doing all this and doing all that because she was just a hard person. How really? old were you when she kicked you out? Shoot, I was 16. Then I came back. Why do you get kicked out? I just, I, it's always been hard for me to follow rules. I've been, a, I never liked rules. I'm just going to be honest right now. You I don't like both. rules. Yeah. <laughs> Even in prison, I don't like rules. I don't like the rules. And she always had strict rules for no reason that she didn't follow herself. So it's like, I never respected the rules. And she just like, all right, well, get the fuck out of here. Isn't it interesting that the punishment of that led you into a way worse life? Yeah. Like if someone had just like stuck with you and just like held you there and just like kept you at home, it may have turned out differently. That's why I would never kick my son out. Like, you know, because I know that can lead you to that. Yeah. But we have to go through it sometimes to figure that out. Yeah. I feel like because if I never went through it, like if I never went to prison and experienced, would it be like how your friends act when you go to prison? How the girls that you was dealing with act when you go to prison? Just everybody in life, period. How your life stops and theirs don't. Yeah. And the same people that you love be the same people that turn your back on you too when you dare. That's some real shit right there. So you get kicked out. Where does this life of crime start? What happens? Like, what's the first crime you ever commit? Oh, uh, we had jumped a Mexican. <laughs> I remember we did. I was sixteen. Uh, get fresh kicked out. I jumped it. We jumped the Mexican. Why? What's the logic? We was just drunk coming back from a party, walking back from a party, and they're just doing dumb shit. But that's like out of character for you because you know you're a good kid and you just you just do it. Yeah, I was just mad. You were mad, mad at the world. Yeah, my grandma kicked me out. I'm t uh, yeah, I was just terrible. And then we were just drunk and turned up. Are you hanging out with a bad group of kids too? Like, at that time? Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We was demons. Really? We was just Yeah, out and about going to all the parties, just fucking the parties up for no reason. When you were doing these types of things, do you do you ever think in your mind, like, I know I'm a good person and, like, this isn't what I want to do, but I'm doing it to kind of fit in? Or, or like, what's the mindset? Honestly, I wanted to do it. I ain't going to lie to you. It was just, like, I, I just, like, adapted to what was going on. I just adapted to it. Like, I just adapted. Do you finish high school? Or no. You, so you dropped out? Yeah, I started going to school, like, 11th, summer, 11th grade summer. I, 12th grade, I was still going, but... And I'm where, leaving. Like, where are you living? Well, at that time, yeah. Shoot, at my friend's house, staying at his oh. house, that house. Then I was staying at my friend Malcolm's house. He ended up got killed right in front of me. Man, so you you started off as like your mom was trying to keep you guys all together and like this stable childhood for the most part, and it just it, it unraveled very quickly. Yeah. What do you What would you say is like the most traumatic thing that happened to you, like before even getting arrested during your your early years? That was that was when my friend Malcolm died. He got killed right in front of me, stabbed right in his chest, bled out, died in my arms. Really? And it, what what was going through your mind when this happened? One, I'm sorry for your loss that that happened, but what was the mindset? What were you feeling? What were you mm. thinking? I, at that time, every time I think about it, it makes me want to cry. Because at that time, I couldn't process what was all going on at that time. I couldn't process it. I couldn't think if he was really dying or not. I didn't know. I just know that he was bleeding so much, and he's still talking hella shit. This is what made me mad, because he's still talking hella shit as he died. And it was just like, it was blowing my shit. So he ended up dying, you know. And it, did that just make you bitter, like angry? It How made me into a whole nother, a way worse person. And you think if that never happened, you wouldn't have traveled down the path that you went on? I can't say that. No. I was still already on that path. I was already on that path. It's just that even enhanced it. That enhanced it faster. I can't imagine losing someone that close to you in your, in your own arms and being in that environment. That's like my little brother. Like I was with him every single day. Like every single day. If you don't see me, you see Malcolm. 
he's that was he's with me all day was there anyone to be there for you like in that moment like afterwards a support system anyone trying to help teachers friends family um my girlfriend my girlfriend was there for me at that time my mom was too I was, he was a, a lot of people were still there like my girlfriend that time who is the mother of my child now she was there for me it was a couple people that was there for me and it still wasn't enough to like kind of straighten things out for you no because i felt like it was my fault you know, I felt like it was my fault. I felt like I could have controlled the situation to where we could have just left before it happened. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I could have, I couldn't control the situation. And his mom blamed me. So it made me even more like I was going through a dark time at that time. Xanax was my thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, what year is this? What, what year are you growing up in? At this time, this was 2011, 2012. 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. So I'm a sophomore in high school. While this, so we're we're about the same age, uh, yeah. give or take. So, what happens next after your friend passes away in your arms? Wh where does the, the how does it spiral? Because you're what 16, right? At that time. Yeah. So by 19, you're you're facing 10 years in prison. So what happens in those three years? It was it was a lot. I got shot. You got shot. Yeah, yeah. I got shot. And where did you get shot? I got shot down here, my like my leg down here, and I got shot through my thigh. Wow. Mm-hmm. In, in my artery. And this is because of drug dealing. I got it's just some some street stuff. You know what I'm saying? Just some some in a way street stuff, honestly, which really didn't matter. Are you in gangs or anything, or how? What's what's going on? Me, I'm just a money dude. I like to get to the money. I like to, you know, what I'm saying I like to be around, chill with females. I just be chilling. So you're one of those like hot-headed young kids that are just like all over the place. And I got a name. Everybody know me. Everybody know me. What were they calling you back then? They call me Boom. Boom back then. Mm -hmm. And where does that come from? Where does that stem from? It take just true story, y'all. <laughs> true story. This come from right. We used to be in the mall back in the day. And there used to be a group of us. And we used to be around, like, just trying to scare people, like, yell behind them and stuff like that. And I used to have a real little voice back then. So I tried to scare the people, like, boom, like that. And everybody just started clowning me. Little ass voice. Uh. They, started going, they started going. And that's how I got my name, Boom, honestly. Okay, so they're calling you, Boom. You're doing all this. What goes down the day that you that affects the rest of your life forever? I was about to say, I will really... Man, I was, a lot of my friends was dying. I lost a lot of my friends. I lost a lot of people, like, at a young age. Like, friends that are, like, at 13, I'm losing my friends. So, that was already, like, basically stirring the pot. Let's say that. It was just already stirring the pot for madness for me. And that's what led to a lot of things. And what would, what would you say was, like, the ultimate thing it, it led to? It led to me going to jail, to federal prison. And how does that happen? How do you get roped up in a federal indictment at, as a teenager? Rich, I get wrapped up having a dude that was my man's like this. Just dealing with him. He come home, I guess he got locked up for a robbery or something like that. So he get locked up for the robbery. The whole time the robbery he's trying to go do was a sting with the feds. He tries to go rob somebody for like some money or something like that and some coke and end up being the feds. So he got lined up by the feds and then start working for the feds and then lined me up, like trying to get me buy guns and stuff like that. He's the same age as you. Right, he was two years older than me. So this is a bunch of teenagers so doing all this crime and the feds are involved. Yeah, and he tried to, he tried to, um, he started wearing a wire on me. As I'm helping, I'm, I'm just being a good dude. I don't even sell guns. I'm just taking them. To A to B. I'm just, all right, you need some guns? I know who got them. You get what I'm saying? And I'm taking them to him. And the feds orchestrated this whole thing? Yeah, with him. Yeah, as he wearing the wire. Yeah. So they gave him the guns to sell? No, they oh. gave him the money to come buy the guns from me. And you had the guns? Yeah. But you weren't even in the gun business. You were just like, whatever. Helping him out. And trying Being to make good. some money. Mm -hmm. I didn't even make no money from it. Really? Yeah, I wasn't even making no money from it. I'm helping one person and helping him. And this was your, your man's? This is my best. You guys were close for years, and yeah. he did... And then one day, this is how I figured out he was working when he had a wire on him. He came over and my man's had sold him a gun that was broke. And he called back and said that, like, hey man, the guns was good. Da 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 da. Hey yo, I'm gonna try to see if I can get some more money and come see you again. And he hung up. And I'm like, ain't nobody in their right mind ain't gonna buy something that's broken or anything messed up of what they wanted to buy and not call you back and be mad about it. And that's what it triggered to let me know 
he working with the feds. He got to be working with some type of police. I didn't know the feds at that time. I just like, he working with the police. But at that point, it's too late. You already made the, the buys and the um, sells. A, a lot of times, eight different firearms have already been sold by that time. So what are you thinking? Are you like, are you fucked? Are you trying to run? What, what's your mindset? This one, I knew that at that time, I had no guidance. <laughs> I know he working with the feds, y'all. And then I make up a grand plot to rob him. Your plot, this is what you're like, this guy's a federal informant, my best friend, and I'm going to rob him? Out of all the things. So how does this go down? Man, this is, has to be a very stupid day of my life. So I'm going to give you, this is a very stupid day as I really think about it. I chose to rob him knowing that he's working with the police. What was I thinking? Drugs, leave them alone, y'all. Then here you go right here. Leave Xanax, all that shit. Leave it alone. Do not have you think you're clear. You're on drugs while you're doing this. Yes. You're Z on Xanax. Z okay. Oh, my God. I was Xanax heavy. Okay. Xanax and, and lean, Percocets, all that shit is, was my choice of drugs at that time. Okay. So you're on the drugs. What do you do? So, boom. So I'm like, oh, man, he working with the feds. So I'm like, you know what? I know what I'm about to do. I'm about to sell him some fake guns. You get what I'm saying? Try to get them for the money like that. That's what I try to do. So I bake, I put actual concrete bricks in a laundry bag. No cap. I put actual concrete bricks in a laundry bag and I walked them out as I'm meeting them and I put them in the trunk. He like, all right, good. I'm trying to look at them real quick. Da, 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 da. So I'm like, oh, no, you can't look at them. You can't look at them. I was like, his camera's there, his camera's this. Yeah, I'm trying to scare him up, lying. He like, nah, I got to look at him. So as he saying he want to look at him, my co-defendant come walking up. As he come walking up, he like, I'm like, hey, yo, you just give the money to him. You get what I'm saying? And he the one with him. You get what I'm saying? You just get the bread to him type shit. Like, that's how it was. You get what I'm saying? When I tried to do that, he wanted to go look at him. After that, it just went, it, it, he still wanted to look at him and went sideways. They put him in the trunk, held him in the trunk. He was with a federal agent. The federal agent tried to get out the car and like, hey, hey, hey. They ended up robbing him too. <laughs> the federal agent. Yeah. Your boys robbed the federal agent. Yeah. So did they swarm the place or what happens? You guys get away? What what goes down next? Oh, we made them we made them get back in the car. Yeah. They got out of there, scared it. If you would have seen the video of like him, he was crying. He was going crazy. I'm talking about you would have thought he got shot. He, I'm telling you, they put a 45 caliber. I'm like, how he know what got it? Well, he didn't even see the guy. <laughs> That's how good it was. That's how he good I he can't was. believe you guys robbed the federal agent. Yeah, right after. He, as soon as we was robbing him, he got off the car. We robbed him too. Got 10,000 off him, 10,000 off him. You knew it was a federal agent? No, we didn't know that was a federal okay. agent. No, but we thought that was his, he said it was like his girlfriend, cousin or something like that. Had you have been sober, would you have ever went to that deal? No. You would have been smarter and pulled away? Yeah, no. I would have. Probably already tried to go somewhere else. Or like, what did the police go with me? All right. So how long does it take for them to wrap you up? When do they like kick down your door or arrest you? They locked up my Cody the next day. They raided oh. them? No. He's so... <laughs> this is how smart my Cody is. After he does that, he comes back on the block the next day. The police come and get him. Lock him up for some weed or something like that and let him go. Came back. As soon as he came back to the block, they came back around and locked him up. Next thing I know, I got a call saying that he was going to Trenton to court. So I'm like, he going to Trenton to court for court. So I'm trying to think, like, what the fuck is he going to Trenton to court? Why was he going to Trenton to court? And then that's when they said it. Oh, yeah, they said that the feds, he got locked up by the feds. I'm like, oh, no. So I ran to Lakewood. I went to my sister's house in Lakewood that we just had brought. We go to my sister's house in Lakewood. He locked up. And... They going to my mom's job. They going to they kicked down my apartment that we already had down there in the little projects we were staying at where we used to be at. They kicked in that house. They looking for me like crazy. They going to my mom's job every day. I'm talking about so much that my mom can't go to sleep. Like she's crying insanely. Like she's calling me. I just can't take it no more. Got me ready to turn myself in. I don't never want to turn myself in. Cause you know it's coming. You know what you're facing at this <laughs> yeah, point. Yeah, about the mother of my child, she's pregnant. I'm about to get ready to have a son. It's just it was a lot going on. I was, oh my gosh, that was a, like one of the stressful moments ever, right there. How long are you uh, on the run for before they get you? Just a month. You, oh, so you do yeah. make it a whole month. I made it a whole month. Is that is that like mentally exhausting being on the run from the FBI? Oh my god, it's very exhausting because you got to stay up all day, all night. I'm at the window looking, trying to see. So when they finally came. It was like a relief, kind of. I ain't gonna lie, it was like a relief. I'm sitting out the window, smoking my blunt, and I see a green tank. I swear to God, it's a green tank with a water hose on the front. I stood up like, oh my God. 
I tap my little cousin a little say, I'm like, say, you see that? He like, oh, we about to run. I'm like, I'm not running no more. <laughs> like, I'm just tired. I'm tired. I could, I was done. My mom called me every night crying. I couldn't do it no more. So they came out. You already know. They pull up. They got the tank looking shit. They got 12 black tie holes. They got Lakewood Police Department. They got the state troopers. I swear to God. They hop out the, when I cut, they, they when the uh, thing rolled up on, on to the lawn, it said, residents at 181 Lynn Court, come out with your hands up now. I swear to God. I come out with my hands up, man. I swear you would have thought it was like a movie or SWAT or some shit like that. When they jumped out the car, they jumped out the car with the guns and would be the AR-15s or whatever the fuck them shit was. They like, get down, asshole. Get down, asshole. Like, oh. <laughs> How did they find you? Uh, to this day, I don't know. Really? I don't know. Were you like using burner phones? Or were you playing it safe? Everything like that? Yeah, because yeah, it was a burner phones. Mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, all my phones I used was burner phones. Not <laughs> even trying to play it safe, though. That's the funny part. It's just... At that time, that's what we sold drugs off of already. Burn the and you're 19 years old. Yeah. Dude, I just like want to give you a hug, man. You had you experienced all this trauma at like a young age, people dying around you, yeah. getting kicked out of your house, and, the, and then this. Yeah. That's so much. Yeah. And it, it must have taken you years to like process all of this and, <laughs> and sit through it. I mean, like, I don't think you, you probably weren't as well spoken and like, mature about the situation back then to really analyze this no but now i mean now you are you're, you're able to analyze it and talk about it and stuff but that that's just so much in like this small period of time yeah so they arrest you they drag you out and where do they bring you oh they took me to red bank new jersey they bring me to red bank new jersey like their little headquarters <laughs> yeah they bring me in there they yeah you get 25 years da -da 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 -da. we got this cell we got this gun we got this but we know you didn't sell the guns. We know you was taking them somewhere. Where'd you take them to? I said, man, y'all gonna take me to the county right now. Oh yeah, well you're gonna, they just started slapping more stuff down. I'm like, I don't care, I could slap down the world. Like, take me to the county, I don't got nothing to say to y'all. So you knew right off the bat you weren't snitching or taking what? a deal? Ain't no question, no, never. Where does that mentality come from? Is that just how you're raised yeah. or the streets? Yeah, I'm, I'm, my grandma raised me like that. Like, you tell, if we come and tell her something, she's gonna smack us about it. So. <laughs> What's your opinion of guys that are in your position that do end up snitching and that are a part of that life that are raised your way, but end up folding? Like, what's your thoughts on that? Like your best friend that snitched on you. Yeah, like, just don't fold. If you, I feel like if you knew what you was doing, literally, if you was committing these crimes and you was doing this and doing that in the streets, as a man, just take your time because you was doing it. It's like with people, like, I don't understand this. A person to uh, uh, really shoot somebody, right? and risk the trial of all these people saying they saw him shoot him and all and he'll really go to trial knowing in his heart he shot the person knowing he guilty yeah like i feel like in that search is in that kind of situation i'm not wishing you to go to jail but you, like bro i don't if i was you you're guilty i'm guilty of it let me get my time out the way i'm not about to risk this in trial and then get 30 years knowing i did it I think some people do go to trial though because they hold on to hope that something could happen. And then when they get 100 years, they be thinking like, damn, they just gave me 100 years for this. No, mm -hmm. you did it. It's like, I don't understand. You knew you did that. I would have took my little plea, did my time, and came home. And, like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> what was your first phone call with your mom like? Oh, man. That's heartbreaking. gotta be hard. Yeah. Heartbreaking. She's distraught. She tell <laughs> What do you say? Because you're sober by this point, right? Yeah. So what are you saying to her? I'm just like, Bob, man, I don't know what's going on. Like, I, they, they, the feds ain't telling me nothing. I'm just waiting to go to court. So now at this point, I got jailhouse lawyers in my head. And what are the jailhouse lawyers saying? Yeah, can you explain what happens when you go to a county and all the other inmates are trying to help you? Oh, man. And they took me to FDC Philadelphia. This is where... I was at Philadelphia, too. They, they I did a me. month there. I yeah. was at Six South. They took me to oh. FDC Philadelphia. First thing they said to you when you walk in FDC Philly, they say, welcome to Philadelphia." Right there, I start saying, you know what? My name is Mike. <laughs> Nobody, my name, boom. And, and everyone's just trying to give you advice about your case. Yeah, and I feel like some people trying to jump on my case, though. I feel like some people trying to talk to me, trying to really jump on my case. Yeah. Honestly, yeah, hell yeah. So, now, what year is it that you get there to FTC Philadelphia? 2013. 2013. Mm -hmm. And your first meeting with your lawyer, what does he say to you? And do you have a public defender or a paid uh, lawyer? No, I had a public defender. And what does he say to you? My public defender just was like, he made me waive off all my rights. I could have got bond. He made me waive off my rights to my bond. What? I don't know. But I think at that time. Were they really going to let you out, though? I mean, you were on the run for a month. And at that time, feds wasn't giving no bonds. Like okay. now, like feds will let you out on a bracelet. 
back then was again not on a bracelet unless she was telling covid changed a lot yeah too. It, mm -hmm. cool. it changed a lot and yeah so i don't know i was i was praying you get what i'm saying i had a house mm -hmm. my grandma was gonna put the house up for me to get out i don't know but he waived my rights and at that time i was mad at him but when i figured out what he did but then i thought about it like now i was happy because it counted towards your yeah, sentence. Yeah, I stayed yeah. in. And if I would have been out, it wouldn't have counted. And I would have been so mad to do all them years more. What? Yeah, oh, I think man. about that sometimes to like the two years I was out. It would have saved me so much stress and gave me some peace if I had just, if I knew I was going to get that. Because you would have been already into the bid. Yeah, yeah, but we also don't know. We don't. At the time when we're going through it. Yeah. And How long are you in holding for detention center before you actually take a deal and sign a deal? Uh, I, I was say like nine months, 10 months in, I finally took my plea and. You took the first offer they gave you? Nah, the, I, I didn't ever even, this the, uh, you might as well say it was the first offer because they never, my first lawyer, I fired him because he used to speak of a plea that he never will bring to me. Like, like hey, so in my head, now I got the jailhouse lawyers, go to trial, they ain't got nothing. Go to trial, I'm telling you. And I'm, oh, I'm, I'm about to go to trial. <laughs> Man. They brug, they superseded indicted me three times. They had three different superseding indictments for the same shit. I never seen this in my life. The same charges, but broken down more. And it's all just over these gun sales. Exactly, but broken down more is that still charges. And, and have, are you hearing like what's going on with your co-defendant and with um, your friend that set nope. you up at the time? Nope. Or are you shut off My from friend, the world? The friend that set me up never went to jail. Never. Never. He yeah, got that's that so one. dirty. That's man. how good he told. Yeah. Like, he probably still working. He probably in Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> but my and my Cody, he never told. He stood, he stood, stood up. My Cody, he good man. He never did nothing. But I didn't know what he was doing now because he was still in my county jail, and they took me all the way to FTC Philly. Now, what's the process like when you're in prison and holding, and you don't like your lawyer and you want to fire him? How does that work? Do you have to write to the judge, or what do you do? Man, I wrote to the judge. You know what the judge told me? The judge told me I'm sending these same letters that you're writing me now to your lawyer. You cannot write me letters about your lawyer saying that you want to fire your lawyer. You have to file a motion with uh, an effective system of counsel or something like that and get him off your case. So I ended up telling my first lawyer, like, man, I don't want you as my lawyer. Don't come back. I don't want you as my lawyer. And then he just filed his own motion, like, all right, I'm getting off your case. And, and then he gave me even more dickhead. And that, but that's the one that gave you the, got you a deal or something? The dickhead that they gave me. <laughs> and so how much man. time do you, are you offered? Uh, they gave me 108 months. Which is equivalent to nine years. Nine years. Mm -hmm. And what are you thinking at that first deal? Are you like, take it or do you want to, what do you, what do you I'm want? I'm like, hell no, I'm not about to take it nine years. I ain't, I ain't felt, I felt like I ain't do that much. Yeah. Did nine years. I'm like, yeah, it's only You didn't guns. kill anyone. Yeah. yeah. He ain't get hurt. He ain't get smacked on no gun. Nothing like that happened. Please. I, I felt like four years, four years. Was <laughs> That's what you're thinking. Four years is fair. Fair. So the, what does the lawyer say? No way. What, what happens? Man, the lawyer he came to me. He said, listen, because I had a motion then where I kind of had the feds around the balls. Paws. I had them. Though. I'm telling you, I had them. I had them with some type of motion where they didn't, they didn't indict me within the 30 days they had. So when this motion going on, I guess the prosecutor go to him like, listen, if he don't go with it, tell him we'll give him a plea to five years. Boom, just to the mandatory 924C, just to the 924C itself. So I'm like, all right, nah, I ain't going for that. You know what I'm saying? I'm about to go through with it. He like, if you go through with it, I'm telling you now, if you lose, and I know you're going to lose, this is what he said. He said, I know you're going to lose. When you do lose, they're going to supersede you, and then your plea that you had is going to be more. And that's exactly what happened. He didn't lie. So that spooked you. Yeah, no, nah, it didn't spook me because I still went through with it. No. I still went through with my motion and lost, like he said. But you didn't go to trial. You just no, no, it was just a motion that I had that I had a real good motion in, that mm -hmm. I could have really just got the 60 months and would have been home, but I didn't. And that's how I ended up getting a nine-year plea. So you could have just took the 60 months. Yeah. Man. Yeah. How's that, how'd that make you feel after <laughs> you got hit with that nine? Like the biggest dickhead in the world. Yeah, but I also feel like you had to try. Yeah. When you're fighting for your life, you got to try. But at that time, I wasn't believing what I believe in now. I was guilty. True. I was guilty. I should have just, I was guilty. I guess we always think there's like, there's a better deal. There's a better, something to be negotiated. You yeah. think there's a way out. I'm thinking about getting home and seeing my son that was just born. That's what I was thinking about. So your son was just born at this time. Yeah. 
How does it feel to be locked up and not being able to see your newborn son? I seen him because they came up on visit, but not to be with him every day is very hard. It was very hard. Were you able to hold him in the visit? Yeah, yeah. All right, so you could actually touch him and, yeah. and, and be with him. Yeah, he was like a little puppy in my hand. Are you close yeah. with your girlfriend at the time? Do you guys have a good relationship? Yeah, at that time. And for you, a couple of years. For a couple of years. What does she think about what you did and your actions that landed you in prison? Oh, she didn't care about that. She knew I was all right. when she met She was me. just down for you. She yeah, was she know what I was into. At one point she tried to act like she didn't know what I was into, but she knew what I was into. I kinda lied when I first met her. Was she like one of those real ones that was like she was gonna ride with you either way? She oh yeah, like most women would do when you first get locked up. Don't worry, I'm gonna be there. I'm doing it day for day. Lies. Dude. Women <laughs> yeah, lie. can you talk. talk about that? Why that's a lie and, and why that differs? Because women to even say that, how do you know what you're going to do in the next year, two years, three years? It's like for you to even think that you're going to predict the future is 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 you a bad motherfucker from, to me? Because how you know? How you know? Th there are cases, though. I met some oh, guys, yeah. a woman rode with him for 10 years, fifth, like all the way religiously. I, she did that bid with him. My old head, Muhammad from D.C., he did 43 years in federal prison. His wife was with him all day. His girl was with him that whole time, but that was... Back in that type of era, though. No hall pass is nothing? Oh, she probably did do something. I don't mm. got shit. If a girl go with some, without sex for all them years, she is the Well, but best. the guy does it, too. So I guess... Yeah, if the girl does it... Ooh, wow. That's hard to believe. Yeah, so this girl abandoned you pretty much off the bat? Or a nah, couple... Of, she, she wrote a little bit? Yeah, she did three years with me. Three years? Yeah, she did three years. That's not terrible. You got to take give the three. I, yeah. I swear, I gave her the three. For, for her first ever doing three's it. Three's a lot, man. Three's a lot. To be and young too, because her seven, mental maturity. She was 17 at the time. Yeah, her mental maturity wasn't there. Nope. So I commend her for that because that was hard to do. So you get this plea deal. You take it. Judge sentences you. Where do you go to prison? My first spot, Lee County. And what is Lee County for those that don't know? Lee County is in Jonesville, Virginia. Lee County is on top of a mountain. Lee County is a United States penitentiary. I'm talking about at this time, Lee County was okay. It wasn't really like how it is now. Lee County at that time had good food. The yard was good. It wasn't too much stabbings, killings, of course, in United States penitentiaries that go on. But at this time, it was good. I was on the E unit. I was chilling. So a 19-year-old walks into one of the toughest prisons in America, penitentiary. I was 20 then. Yeah, like I said. 20, you're, you're still young. young. How do you navigate? Like, what do you do? What is your, like, first few days like? Can you walk me through that? Well, when you first get there, you know, everybody want to know where you're from. And, and it's crazy because when you walk in, like, if I was with a Spanish dude, I was with a white dude. I see the Spanish dude come in. All the Spanish dudes run to him. They're going to I see a bag coming for him. He got sweatpants. He got everything coming to him. Same thing for the white dude. When the black dude come in, you know what they said to me? They, where you from? I said, yeah, I'm from Jersey. Oh, you from Jersey? All oh, the Jersey dudes over there. Like, there wasn't no, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, now that you say that, it does, I do see that. Yeah, yeah because the, the white guys bring a care package that the other guys bring. The only ones I would see was like the Muslims would bring, right. like, a, a care package. Oh, yeah, they would. But, it just, I don't, it, it's something about like the black community that it's very aggressive right off the bat. Because you got to think, the whites and the Spanish, they didn't even ask them where they was from yet. Yeah. They just brought them to bag. From the get-go, they already asked them where I'm from. Yeah. <laughs> That's how much hatred was right there. It's just like, like you said, it's just so much hatred within blacks. It's crazy. So you tell them where you're from, what happens next? Oh, then they introduce me to where the Jersey dudes is and stuff like that. And... And that was that. I started, they like, yo, you gotta get your paperwork, da 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 da. And so I'm like, what I gotta get? They're like, sentencing transcripts. So, but when I was in FDC Philly, everybody used to be like, you gotta get your docket sheet, your plea agreement, your PSR. <clears throat> they didn't care about none of that. Are you scared, like, to be 20 in a penitentiary? I ain't gonna say I was scared, but I definitely was nervous. I was trying to fill it out, because, like, I used to hear stories about the penitentiary. And hold, like in the holdings, but I've never been there, so I don't know. So I'm just hearing about all this killing going on. So I am kind of not scared, but nervous. I'm trying to figure out what's going on, but I know I didn't tell. So I'm like, shoot, when I get my paperwork, I'm going to be all right. You know what I'm saying? And that's what happened. My paperwork came, and I was all right. And, and when you mean all right, like, do they start taking care of you now? Mm -hmm. and how does that work? Well, already, they already give you the bag. They give you the speech. Do not take this bag if you are a rat, 
a child molester, a rapist, or any, do not take this bag if you know you messed up. If you messed up, man, do not take this bag, because if you take this bag and we find out you messed up, we're going to kill you. So they already give you the bag speech and all that. So now when my paperwork comes, they read it, duh, duh, okay, he good. Now yeah. on that note, though, guys do take the bag that are fucked up. What, oh. what happens? What have you seen happen to these guys that take the bag? I seen a native dude get stabbed through his neck. I swear to God, I seen a native dude get stabbed through his neck. He didn't know where to run. He didn't know if he wanted to try to run out the door, run to the police. He just looking around because he was he was messed up. He was a sex offender. He's a sex offender. And he took the bag. Yeah, the natives don't play. I ain't gonna lie, the natives don't play in the fed pens. And I, I've met a lot of native sex offenders. Not saying they're all sex offenders. But they'd be, they'd be some. There's a lot, and and some of them are protected because they're native. But it comes to find out that they are. They'll find out through a guard or anything like that. This dude, they got something called like the native mob, like they own little gang in a native culture, and that's what the dude was. And they didn't play. They stabbed him through his neck. That was my first time ever seeing like blood squirt through people's neck. I thought he was like dead. I don't know if he died to this day. And you saw this this whole thing go down. Yeah, yeah. I seen a lot. And Lee Cotter seen a lot of people get stabbed. And I what? broke a dude jaw up there with a lock. That's how I got shipped out. You did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lock. All right, we'll get to that point. Yeah. But while you're in Lee County, what, what other violence are you seeing on like a day-to-day -day basis? People are fascinated with that aspect. Well, in the penitentiary, it, it's like you be locked down so much that as soon as you come out, something else happens. You get what I'm saying? It's like, it's, it's like a revolving door. As soon as something happens, we go on lockdown a week, two weeks, three weeks. As soon as we come out, I swear, if it don't happen that day, it's going to happen that week. A bus going to come in. Somebody was hot or somebody did this. Somebody did that at the last spot. So something's going to happen. So what, what would you say was the worst thing you've seen and then the longest lockdown because of that? Uh, I'm going to say the worst thing I seen was when that riot happened between the, um, it really was, I guess a DC dude got stabbed or, or a DC dude killed or stabbed up a black can in Big Sandy at that time. And it leaked over into Lee County and we had a full race riot. It leaks over from another prison. Right. And a whole race riot. Mexicans, I've never seen nothing like that. Mexicans come out to the chow hall, all masked up wow, and just start taking off all the black people. I'm talking about in the yard was a bloodbath. And what happens? The prison gets locked down. Or are they like pepper spraying you guys? What, what goes pepper down? Pepper spraying, just what? Putting everybody in cuffs. The whole jail was on lockdown for two months. Two months. And what, what happens during a prison lockdown in the penitentiary? Oh, man. You, you in the cell for two days. Then you come out for that one day to take your shower. And then you go back in. You're going to come back out them two more after two more days like that. And who, who are you celled up with? Yo, one person, or you better, if you ain't got a celly, you ain't got a celly, but you're going to be shelled up with one of your people that's like from your car. Like, so Jersey they won't or, put you with like someone that's someone else, or like, is it, is it, is it race or is it location? How does that work with cellmates? Yeah. I, yeah. You're going to, it's going to be really race and where you're from because you ain't going to see no whites and black person in the room or no Mexican and black person in the room like you or Mexican. You hardly will see that. Like, they have to be in the same car, and that has to be like they told you you could do that. Yeah, just not really gonna see that. Now, are there chomo sex offenders walking these compounds or no? no? Not them compounds. Is it so it's not good. Do you, do some make it through accidentally? No. Oh, so they them. don't even put them on. I seen I seen some people that ratted that made it through the penitentiary. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, Jimmy Hinchman. Jimmy Hinchman was on the yard. Jimmy Hinchman ratted. He's on the yard. And but what he Muslim town. And what happened to him? Nothing. Jimmy oh. Hitchman is a strong dude. You ain't going to do nothing to Jimmy Hitchman. Really? No. Wow. Now, prison guards, are they corrupt? Like, what kind of corruption are you seeing in these penitentiaries? I ain't going to say they corrupt because they ain't going to do nothing for you. But they definitely will watch you die. They will watch you die. They will watch the dude stab you up or you stab with it. They will watch it. Are, are inmates attacking the guards? Yeah, that's regular. Really? Yeah, I just seen that. Seen For what though? Why? The guy's just doing his job. Shouldn't there be some type of like respect level on that sense? Some seals don't got respect. So what was what's like? Give me a scenario. I see. Shoot, I see the seal get stabbed just by taking the dude pen. He took a guy's pen. They took a guy's pen in a disrespectful way. But the dude had life, and he had that pen for twenty one years. And he said that that pen he had, he used to restore with ink, and that same pen is the same pen he was writing his daughter for 21 years with. And wow. when you take that, like, that's his favorite pen, he really took that to the heart. And he kills the cop or just stabs him? Yeah, he killed the cop. He killed the cop? Yeah. And how long are you guys going lockdown after that? That was like three months. Wow. The cop just gets killed right there over the pen. Yeah. I mean, when you, I guess when you're dealing with guys that have nothing to lose, 
Yeah, they don't, that, that don't mean not that. That's nothing. Wow. He, he go, go to ADX, do 10 years up ADX, come back out. And that's it. Yeah. That's How, did you get to interact with a lot of guys that had life? Yeah. And in the penitentiary, 85% of the yard got life. No, we can never like talk to these guys because they're, they're doing life. What's like the mindset of some of these guys that are, are they like accustomed to not ever coming out or do they hold on to hope or how no, do they... all, all dudes with life really hold on to hope. I ain't gonna lie to you. All of them think they go and I pray they do all of them think in their head that someday, somehow some, something's going to come through for them to go home and they're going to go home. And I pray they do. I really do. Even the guys that have done like some bad shit, like murders, stuff like that. I feel like everybody could be forgiven as long as I can't forgive you. If like you touched a kid or something like that. Now that, and I don't, I feel like you should never come home. If you did something or you just raped a woman and like really like that stuff, I feel like you shouldn't come home from. I'm sorry. That's just like out of pocket. A lot of these life cases, what are um what are they in prison for? Because the feds is there's not too many murders in the feds, right? And if it is, it's racketeering. Okay. Most of them be in there for murders, racketeering, like drug cases. Yeah. I've seen people got life over a brick of crack. And get gave my license. But those, they're starting to try to like reverse and, and do good on that. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of people get, and I've seen some people give back life. Like after 20 years, like it's, it's like a, un, a written rule in the feds. They give you a life sentence, but after you do about 18, 19, 20 years, they'll give you back and let you go home. Yeah, I had guys on the podcast, two brothers, Lyle and Lonnie Jones, which was a really good interview. They got life and they got out under the First Step Act yeah. and they were under um, crack, um, the crack laws. Mm -hmm. And I had met guys when I was at Fort Dix that when Obama was his last days in office, they had, you know, 20, 30 years and they got pardoned mm -hmm. down his last week. It's really wholesome, like seeing all those guys go home and everything. Mm -hmm. So I you don't do your whole bid though at this place. What happens nah. that gets you kicked out of there? Yeah, I broke a dude's jaw with a lock. Lock and a sock. Yeah, yeah. He he was stealing, and he, and that's how it goes. Like politics, when it comes to the feds, you can't steal. You can't do certain things on the yard, like gambling and owing debts, like the stuff like that. So what do you do? Like your guys said, you have to go handle this, or no? Nah, I just wanted to do it. I was just young and just like excited to do it. Like they like, yeah, you gotta go. Da, da, da. So I'm like, I want to do it. I right. want to do it. And, you know, we'd meet a lot of guys like you in prison, those young, like the hotheads. And when we, they'd come down from mediums to the low, guys are like, dude, you got to chill out because you're going to ruin it for people because they're like eager to like pop shit off. Yeah. So you take it and what do you do with it? Uh, I, put it I put the lock inside two socks. It's a master lock. I put it inside two socks. Boom. And on the way walking out, before we walked out, because you got to go through two uh, metal detectors in the USB. You got to go out through the first metal detector. You got walk. So right before we was about to get through the first one, I smacked them with the lock. And then me and the dude started jumping the dude, and the police started spraying us, and they took us to the shoe. And how long were you in the shoe for? I was in the shoe for about, like, five months. Five months. What's it like to be in shoe the whole <laughs> solitary for five months? Um, they called me the god of the shoe. Really? I'm, I'm in, I, I did more shoe time. I did more time. In prison, in the shoe that I did on actual combat. So out of the 10 years you got, how much time do you think you were spent in the shoe? Like seven years. Seven years? I probably got about seven, six years in the shoe. Bro, That how does that affect you mentally, you. man? That's got to... Because I'm always into stuff, man. I'm telling you, I'm always... If anybody watch this right here and they comment on it, they all going to say, yeah, he's not lying. I'm always into dumb shit, man. I was always into something stupid. Yeah. Yeah, it's just dumb shit. Now, can you talk about the shoe a little bit? Like, what's it like? What's the, like, uh, showering in the shoe, everything? And you're in a cell oh, all day. There's it, Is there commissary? What can you do? It's Yeah, commissary do come. It depends. It depends what spot it is, what, what prison you at that will give you commissary. Because some spots, commissary come in, it won't be nothing on their list. Like, you can't get no food. won't be no deodorants. You know what I'm saying? Nothing like that. Like, you're like, why would you even have a commissary list? And then it's like, in the shoe, man, like, people got things called cars in the shoe where they take haul bags and they, uh, like, basically wet tissue and put it inside the hauls bag or whatever, a milk carton, and you, like, rip off your sheet to your, to, your, uh, to your blanket and you tie it onto the little thing you made, and that's just how you get to people who sell is across from you or up from you and everything. And y'all could trade whatever y'all trying to do or send night uh, kites or whatever. Wow. And showers in the shoe. How does that go down? Oh, they so nasty too. Showers. Oh my God. The showers in the shoe is so nasty, but this less like, it's a little, 
literally the shower was so small, man. It was in your cell. Yeah, some okay. some some of them have showers in the cells, and then sometimes the guards gotta come and cuff you up and take you to the ones up. But yeah. more than likely, it's showers in the cell. And did you have a cellmate most of the time in the shoe? Yeah. See me, I like to have a cellie in the shoe. So you could talk to them. Yeah. Because I feel like you go crazy if you don't have someone to talk to. Yeah, I rap all day. I'm talking about I'm all day rapping. I'm at the door. I'm talking shit to the police, throwing shit, piss on them, all types of stuff. I'm just going crazy. Knowing what you know now about prison and the shoe and everything, do you think that the shoe is a good tactic that the prison uses? Hell no. That is, people go crazy behind the shoe. I watch people literally go mentally crazy behind the shoe. I feel like. 30 days is good enough. They be having people back there forever sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, invested. That's a, that the feds can do you dirty. Cause they could say, Oh, you're under investigation. Just mm -hmm. keep you there. Yeah. I'll just come get you for nothing. Yeah. I would see a lot of investigations. Got uh, guys sleeping with female staff. Yeah. Did you see that at all through your prison time? I, I never seen somebody like mess actually mess with like, get us like actually fuck one. No. Or have sex with one? No, never seen it. But, but you hear about it. Yeah, I done heard where dudes done touched the CO butt or grabbed her hand or rode her a kite. <laughs> like, yeah, it's crazy. It's so crazy. What go it's like a whole world, man. It really is. Like the stories, like you could take a hundred inmates and they're all gonna have a different story from man. prison. Like if they are all, all sitting and talking about it. Don't let me get started on the people who like jerk off to the us, uh, the women inmates. Uh, all right, so we have to talk about that. <laughs> Especially in the shoe. Someone that spent a lot of shoe time. They would do like the weekly walkthroughs, mm -hmm. everyone, and inmates are sitting there whacking off oh in God. the cell. Yep. What's the logic? Why do they do this? And and what are these guards' reactions? I got this right here for my DC dudes. The DC dudes say that it's called being in the game. This is what they call it. They call it you got to be in the game. So I'm like, what? The, what is in the game? So they say that when you is jerking off to a woman. And if she's looking into your eyes, she's in the game. So I said, what if they not looking into your eyes? They said, Slim, no matter what, they in the game. I said, no, this is just creepish. This is creepish behavior. I cannot get into this. I can, it's not me. And they're not the only ones, though. Everybody from every state, they got people who we call them jack-off artists. Jack-off artist? Yeah. Yeah, I've heard different names. I've Jack-off artist is the first. Mm -hmm. He's a gunner. That's what that's a gunner, I've heard gunner, yeah. yeah he's a snipers. Gunner, yeah. Snipe, yeah, he sniped. He sniped it. So do you, have you ever witnessed this go down? Yes. In Probably. your in your cell too or no? No, they, they ain't nobody going to do that with me. I'm going to have to do something very bad to you yeah. if you do that because that's very disrespectful. But you like like you said in the shoe, you can hear it like oh, the girls, but oh my God, you creeped up. But no. guy, other inmates don't consider this like sexual harassment or rape or anything like that. Some people do. Some people like you creep, bro. And they won't. They won't tolerate <laughs> that. Then they'll yeah. handle that. Yeah. yeah, you got. Yeah, you got some people who uh, we don't stand for that, bro. Yeah. Then you got some like the old DC car. You got some DC. They go, Those DC guys are wild. They win. Yeah. They, you was praised if you do it. All right. So on that note about DC guys, I've heard a lot about like gay for the stay and, and that terminology. What is like? What is that exactly? You got so good DC men. I can't do that to all of them. I got some good DC men that I really genuinely love. Like they are good dudes and they not with none of that. Yeah. And then you do got some that be on that type of time. That is the truth. And they will say it themselves. They we they don't care. They don't care. They feel like if they get head from a man, it's not gay. But then they'll get out of prison and they'll be fine. They just They girl be fine with it. Like their girl will know that they was dealing with men inside prison and be okay with it when they come home. I think the D C car has like the worst rep in, in on the East Coast. They're known for being like very Everything. vicious towards white guys. Whoa, you, yeah, they all yeah. Yeah, they they look at them and you know, as like prey. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And they're like the, those are guys that'll like you know they'll rape someone or they'll do yeah, whatever I, and they I, think it's acceptable. I seen it happen. They, I seen somebody get raped. I see go ahead poop a do. D does that, that make you think about there. things? Does that like scare you or like? Are, it didn't scare me because I know nobody was gonna do nothing to me. But yeah. I ain't gonna lie, DC dudes are savages, man. man. If they if they can smell that you weak. They're, they're on you, man. The hyena's going to come for you, man. And they really act like that. I'd see guys like licking their lips like they're like, mm, mm, mm. like if they're coming down from like a medium and stuff and they they have to hold themselves back. Like, hey, bro, we're not at a medium no more. We're at a low. Like this ain't how the shit goes down. Right. Did you uh, go on Con Air at all? Oh, yeah. I've been to Oklahoma like eight times. All right. Time. So talk, talk about your experience, Con Air, that process in Oklahoma. Man, man. Shoot. My first time being on there, they took us to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I go to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and when you ride up, first you just stop. 
because it's like you go around this little bend and when you pull up, you're pulling up to like this old, a bit like looking abandoned airport. So you you might sit on that bus right there for like two or three hours before the plane come. You'll see when the plane come and everything, circle around, land. And when you finally go through the, the gate, the bus, y'all got to all line up. And I'm talking about this, a whole bunch of buses. And the plane is right there. And it's people coming off the plane and they got to go to the side and stand in lines like inmates. While all of us inmates are getting loaded off the buses. And then they'll call us one by one to go get searched and all that to go up on the plane. And when you see the fed plane, swear to God, got a United States flag on like the little tail of it. And one of them is no lie. It got a duck. Got duct tape got around it. Duct tape. True story. It's not a lie. That's definitely not a lie. That is a true story. They still have it to this day. Yeah. And the marshals, they have guns uh, yeah. surrounding the plane, and mm -hmm. you're chained up. Yeah, I know the I, I know the marshals' names by heart. They know my name by heart. Oh man, are you like talking shit to them? Every what? time I get on there, I start talking <laughs> shit. They like, oh, we don't care, man. You all, where you going now? Like they always yell at me. And and they bring you to Oklahoma. What's Oklahoma City like? Oklahoma, when I got there, it was a long ass hallway. I'm talking about the long hallway, long with a bench on this side. It used to be two benches long like that, but they cut it in half for like the women on that side now. But it was a long bench, long hallway, and you got to sit down and you wait in Oklahoma. You're sitting there until everybody could get up, and you got to walk on this like long wooden type box, and they take the chains off, y'all, and then you go to a big room and change out and all that. And there's only like one little toilet in this giant holding oh, uh, room, too. And it's like 100 people in the room. And they're waiting because they have to process each person in. I remember getting there at 7. You don't get up to the unit till like 2 or 3 a.m. sometimes. I swear. I, and you go from one room, big room, to another big room, to another big room. You just... <laughs> yeah, people could play in like about um, airlines and waiting and cancellations and shit. You mm. have not experienced pure airline suffering until you ride Con Air and go through that. Imagine trying to get up and you got to take a shit or a piss and you cuffed up and you by the window. Yeah. Move. It ain't, and you getting a cheese sandwich while the, the marshals would be chowing down on McDonald's or mm -hmm. Burger King in yeah, the plane. Yeah, and they they do touch on purpose. Yeah. Two cookies, yeah. you get a, a, a water, a, say Oklahoma on the water. All right, you've been to a lot of different prisons in America, federal prisons. I'm sure you've seen a lot of different currencies. Can you talk about like what the currency is used on different yards and who sets the currency and how it works? Well, most of the yards I've been on mostly be like books of stamps, actual mailing stamps. But they say in like Lowe's, like the money would be food or something like that. Like people would take food as the currency instead of books of stamps. Now, how does someone convert books of stamps into actual legit money? How do, What's the process? I mean, well, you can have, shoot, as a person that make the phone call, like, yo, I'm trying to buy these, da 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 for my mans. They could have cash app, time, or you could physically make the person bring the people the money, uh, Western Union. Yeah, cash app is definitely big in prisons oh, now. Yes. Are you seeing a lot of cell phones too in, in the prison? Not really, but you, you, Farrington, I've seen some, I've seen some spots now, some spots that had them. Maybe when you got to the mediums, not yeah. so much as the penitentiaries are harder to get in. Yeah, they were real hard. Now back to the currency, like books of stamps, do people sell them in, in bulk at a cheaper rate? Like say 10 books normally goes for a hundred dollars. It'd be $70. It would be $70 mm -hmm. if you buy a bunch. Some people 50. Now, did, mm -hmm. did you gamble at all or anything mm -hmm. like that? I used to stay rolling dice. I loved CeeLo, man. Yeah, we yeah. had my my man's dice come on the show and he explained the CeeLo game. Mm -hmm. Dude, you know what it was? I think it was the DC car that put me onto it. Yeah. And I would be shooting them all night. And yeah. It was just, dude, It's there's an adrenaline. I'd do it for hours. It was so much fun. Yeah, I love CeeLo. That's <laughs> I'm talking about you might walk with the unit and it'll be a group of inmates sitting there with the CeeLo, smoking, whatever. CeeLo like, man, just let them do it. <laughs> Dude, it's it's such a fun time, and it passes time, and the guys love it. Uh, and now smoking, you mentioned smoking. What is K2, and why is it so big in federal prisons? Oh, my God, because K2 is where they can't, if they if they give you a urine test, it's not going to come up in your urine. So instead of smoking weed or, like, some people take some boxes and it come up in your urine, K2, it doesn't. So everybody smokes it. That shit fucks you up. What? Now, like, I would go to the bathroom <laughs> at night, and they would have a chair in the bathroom stall. And I'm like, what's this chair for? They're like, come over here 10, 11 o'clock at night. You'll see why. What are you seeing some of these guys do on K2? Yeah, I seen a dude so hot one time off K2. He got high. He started smoking. He burst out the room. Started running. I'm like, why? Why? He like, 
he get to the middle of the floor and he just start throwing up. Uh, uh, and he got like orange throw up. His throw up was like orange. Uh, then he jumped down on the ground and started like swimming through it. Like, I'm in Sea World. I'm in Sea World. <laughs> I swear to lie. I could die right there. I, I was crying. I'm talking about the whole unit was crying laughing. And what does the prison do when they, they get these guys? And there's no way to prove that they were actually on drugs, right? They, they, they took them down to medical, cleaned his ass up, and brought them right back to the unit. And some of these guys, like when it's count time, I know other inmates are trying to get them into the cell oh my God. right for count because yeah. these guys be fucked up. And, yeah, it's like, bro, get in the cell. Yeah, like, yeah, because you're going to make us get locked down or you're going to make something happen that it don't have to if you just get your high ass in the room. Did you have a prison hustle at all to make money? Mm -hmm. I used to sell cigarettes, K2. I used to be selling with you. Anybody tell you, I walk around the yard, I got pizza slices, candies. I do everything on the yard. Roof it. How did you um, get tobacco in to sell? <clears throat> it wasn't. We used to steal it from the guards. They used to have spit. They would spit in the cup, and we used to get it, and then we would steam it up, bring it back to like tobacco, break it down, and sell it. Wait, you would take a guard spit, mm -hmm. steam it? How would you steam it up? You, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta steam the cup up like somebody makes a fire or something like that, or um, they make a, like a candle, and you'll put like a cup of water under the candle, and you'll put a thing of plastic over top of the cup, and you poke little holes through it, and you'll put the it's not the spit, but it's like the little like the little like wettish glob balls that they used to have. I don't know, I can't explain it, that comes inside the stuff and you have to pour it out and you put it on top of that. And the steam from the smoke uh, dry it out. This is kind of gross, man. Yeah. <laughs> so how much are you selling this for? I'm selling them, some people buying cigarettes for um, $3. Some people buy cigarettes $7, then you got $10 of cigarettes. Do you roll it in the toilet paper tissue? Yeah, they'd be like, the, not the, but the thing that come inside the toilet paper like that, the thing that come. Yeah, the wrapper. Because mm -hmm. that's what the guys are smoking yeah, they, out of. they smoke it up. I see, I don't smoke cigarettes. So it was like all profit for me. Yeah, so what was your profit margin? You selling it for three? How much did it cost? Did you have to pay someone to roll it or are you rolling it yourself and steaming I, it? Oh, no, yeah, I was doing it myself and steaming it, but I give it to somebody to sell. Like I just give it to them and they going to roll up their cigarettes. So What are like some unique prison hustles? Like we hear about the basic ones, like having a store, tattooed this. What are like some... Uh, original, like, creative prison hustles. Man, it's a dude who can make remotes basically out of your watches. I, I'm i like, I told him, I'm like, I don't know what you're doing in prison. This man made an actual remote control out of his watch where he could change the channel from his watch. No lie. And how much would he sell, like, a remote for? What would it be used for? He sells remotes, like, he $300. And what would someone use a remote for? To change the channel on the TV. Because the other inmates would break the other remotes? Yeah, or just you can't, or you couldn't get a remote. You might not have a remote to the TV. You might have to or get tired of going to the guard, getting the remote. You know what I'm saying? Some people be tired of that. Now, back to the uh, something I, I'd never asked someone about is toilet paper in federal prison. Can you explain that process, like how it's distributed and why it's so sacred in federal prisons? Because they get you two rolls. Like every week they'll come by like... The day that they do maintenance and give you your soap and stuff like that, they give you two rolls. Some spots, they won't be petty like that. Some dudes just throw it out like, here, take it. I don't give a fuck. But then some spots, you're going to get two rolls, one for you or one for your celly, or you're going to get four rolls, two for you or two for your celly. And it, it's like, it, it's bad, especially when commissary is locked down, you can't buy new ones. Oh, my God. You have to, like, preserve that. Right. And I never really thought of it. Like, I never went through the whole two rolls. Guys would be like, yo, can I get that? And I'm just thinking it's like, it's toilet paper. Sure, man, you got to have the roll of toilet paper. Old time is really gold. But Pe some guys, yeah, some guys have like a net bag full of, full of toilet paper under their bag. It's like stuffed, not even, com and then they would also have bags of commissary mm -hmm. um, that are just under their bag in case of a lockdown. Mm -hmm. They're stocking up for the next lockdown. Mm -hmm. And don't let them be the store, man. <laughs> <laughs> dude it's it, it's so crazy man yeah what about like shakedowns are they doing sell shakedowns oh my or God. yes they do they do issue and you might have like a unit manager who wants to do that on a specific day every week so how does that go down what's the process um basically they, it's called inspection they walk around inspect your room everybody got to stand outside they sell or just be outside they sell while they walking around inspecting they go in your cell and look through your cell see if your bed was made stuff and they'll go through your shit, and whatever they find, they find, trust and believe, you're going to the shoot. Once they lock that door, you know, up, oh, he going to jail. Wow. What do you think was the hardest thing about prison for you? 
The hardest thing about prison for me, I'm gonna say is like, you be so out of touch with your family, especially if you get sent so far and then they be taking like your phone. Like if you see Dave Cho when you in the shoot, they take your phone 90 days. They might take common sense, you know what I'm saying? So being out of contact with your family is very, very like, it's very hard. Yeah. And especially when you're in the higher security prisons where there's no self easy access to cell phones. Mm -hmm. And where was the farthest they had shipped you out to? The farthest I went to was Atwater. And where is that? California. California. And your family, <coughs> your family's in New Jersey and they're sending you to California. Mm -hmm. But that was your own doing. Like, yes. it's not like it was your first time ever in prison. And they sent you right yeah. there. No, nah, 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 no. Nope. What, at what point do you change your mindset? And you're like, I got to get my shit together. Like, I can't keep doing this. I didn't. I'm going to tell you the truth. I didn't. The I'm, whole prison bed, you were just... Yeah. Day really? for day. I didn't get no halfway house. I didn't... Nothing. I, I, I did. I went to the halfway house and was home 17 days, and they sent me right back. Looking back on it now, why do you think that was? And do you I regret was, that at all? Yeah, I do regret it. I was young. I just was just young and just really clout chasing. I'm going to tell you all the truth. I was just clout chasing. I wanted everybody to know my name in the feds and all that, and, and that's how it is now. I don't, and you lost your entire 20s. Yeah, I lost my entire 20s. Do you think about it now? Like, I could have had more time with my son. Like, yeah. I could have done so many yeah. different things. Yeah, do I. Uh, but at that point in life, and this is the realest thing I could say, I lost, like, love for people. Like, real life lost love for, like, anybody that was out in the real world that didn't. Like, I didn't care about nobody at that time no more. Nobody. I felt like everybody was against me. So, Why? Why did you feel that way? Because a lot of people I used to do stuff for when I was home ain't showing the same love no more to me while I'm in jail. But do you feel like they owed you that? And that was very selfish of me, but I did feel like they owed me that because I felt like if they was in my shoes, I would be going crazy for them. Now, knowing what you know now, would you be crazy for them? No. It, you wouldn't? No, because I know they wasn't crazy for me. No, but if it was different people, like if the roles were reversed, it was entirely different people. Oh, yeah, I'll go crazy for them. If now that you've done a 10-year prison sentence, if like say you have a new best friend, he gets 10 years, you're going to be with him? I'll be, it's people I take care of. I'll take care of about like 10 people right now in jail every day. They, yo, I need $50, or oh, I need this, or oh, I need that. Some people don't have anything. Yeah, I know, and I know that. And that's why they call me, because they know that I know how I feel to be in a situation. So they know I'm going to take care of them. Yeah. Were there ever times that you called people back home and they didn't help you and you, you felt like abandoned or lost mm -hmm. or like of an course. empty feeling? Yeah. And what about your mom during this whole 10 years? My mom did day for day with me. I love her to death. You guys talked and, and stayed close. My mom made sure she said if it wasn't $50, it was $100 every Wednesday. Wow. That whole nine years straight. That, that's, a, that's a mom right there. Mm -hmm. She held you down. Mm -hmm. And what about your siblings? Were you close with them? during? I know the other brother got arrested, but... Uh, well, he got arrested. He just got arrested. Though. Okay. That, that just happened to him like three years ago. That just happened. He wasn't... But I was already locked up when... Yeah, so I was locked up when he caught that, so... But, um... Yeah, like... I don't know. What about your dad? Was Were you in touch with him during your bed? He was in jail. Yeah, but we can't. Um, sometimes they set it up where you can communicate. We was writing. I was writing them, and then when he had came home, while I was still in, and then went back in while I was still in. And you probably think that th that was like cool because you were clout chasing, or no? No, I didn't think that was cool oh. at all. I ain't gonna lie to you. I thought that was the dumbest thing ever. Like how you come home, like you. He went to jail twice while I was doing that one bit. Do you think that's, that's when your mentality started to change when you saw him do that? Yeah. Like, did that make you think at all uh, about things? Yeah. When I got to the end of my bed, and it, because once I lost all my good time, it was like, I didn't give a fuck. I didn't care about nothing. So it was like, it, it ain't nothing can happen to me no more. Like, I'm invincible, honestly. That's how I felt. I felt invincible. There's nothing you can do to me. I'm going to go home regardless on this day. You can't stop me. How much time do you end up serving? The whole 108 months. And what could you have gotten out of if you, if you had acted accordingly and Shoot, I would have did seven, I would have did like seven, almost seven years, eight months or something so like that. So you gave them like a free two years almost. Yeah, lost that, all of it. That's crazy. Yeah. And, and for like what, you know? For clout. For clout. Yeah. For clout. It, it's crazy, like the things we do, you know, to appease certain people or to, to be liked or fit in or anything yeah. like that. So and there's, there's sometimes I had to stay in no business though, because sometimes mm -hmm. some some of the CEOs might disrespect me. Then I don't beat up the police. They got the you hit jumping. a CEO a lot of times. I don't fought the police on many prisons. Out of Wood, Leavenworth. I don't fought the police 
just McDowell, West Virginia. What's like the craziest uh, fight with a CEO story? That, that one in McDowell, that one they sent me to Big Sandy. Mm-hmm. Man, the CEO, I don't know what he was on that day. I guess he had got into it with the inmate I was talking to, but he came in. I'm talking about hot too. Yeah, what you talking about now? Talking to the inmate. So I'm talking with the inmate. I'm like, damn, you ain't even gonna say like, excuse me, no nothing. Like you just straight came and bombarded our conversation. He like, what? I'm like, you ain't say excuse me. You just came over here and just, you know, came right into our conversation. He like, what? Matter of fact, you shut your bitch ass up. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck me, I ain't gonna lie. He said, he said, you shut your bitch ass up. I said, what? Yeah, I ain't, I ain't like him. I'll fuck you up. Like that, right? He was like, what? He said, man, I'll, he said, he's like, I said, man, I'll fuck you up. He was like, go down to the lieutenant's office. I started walking to the lieutenant's office. He started walking with me. He like, yeah, yeah, you lucky. I, I would have fucked your bitch ass up. I'm like, yeah, all right. You know not to say nothing. I would have really fucked you up. And he grabbed my plate. I was eating some food. Grabbed my plate and swung it. I punched him, and we started fighting right there. And he hit the button, and the police came. They fucked me up. And what's the button? Um, I guess it's a it's the button they push on the side. That's the code for them to make the other police come, saying he in distress, he need help. So what happens? The police came and they fucked me up. They raid like a, a swarm of them. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing like when a button got hit, they drop what they're doing and, and they run straight yeah, there. They're yeah. all runs trained to run straight there. There you go. So yeah. what do they like tackle you? What goes down? Yeah, they tackled me. Um, they were stomping on my head, stomping on my neck, twisting my legs and twisting my arms and doing all this crazy stuff. And then they finally cuffed me. So when they cuffed me, that's when they really start going in. <laughs> I felt like they was doing the rock elbows and all. <laughs> Dude, you're lucky you didn't get another charge, man. That yeah, you made it through this whole 10 year sentence without getting indicted again or, or charged or anything like almost. that. Oh, oh, whoa. Oh, oh, man. One dude I stabbed at McKean. Yeah. Dude, oh. this makes me sick here. One, this dude, that whole yeah. one, thing I, one dude I stabbed at McKean. It was wow. serious. It was serious a charge. They were trying to get me. Really? And you were just like carrying around shanks and, and, and doing all this? Man, I used to make shanks out of the tan khakis they give us. Yeah. I used to be able to sharpen shanks with them. No wow. Doubt. It's like the fabric. For some reason, you could use them and then it sharpens the, the now, knife. In the feds, do they give you razors like they do in the other ones? Like, how do you shave? They give us weak razors, though. Like, but you could pop them open? Yeah, yeah. That's what people be like cutting these summer dogs and all that stuff. Yeah, so they still give you razors? Yeah, yeah. Does anyone get hurt with a razor in prison? Well, yeah. Don't what? you think it's a bad idea to, get, yeah. to give some violent criminals some <laughs> razors? Especially with New York dudes, man. New York dudes is like razorologists. They could just... <laughs> It's just good. It slice your face wide open. Is there anything like you regret now doing in, in prison, like against someone else or anything like that? Yeah, I, there's a lot. All the stuff I, I really wish I didn't do because I didn't have to do it. I just was clout chasing, wanting to do stuff for nothing. I wish I never did it. Does it does it keep you up at night thinking about it sometimes? Yeah, a lot of stuff that I went through in prison definitely keep me up. Like I still like get inside my shower with my shower shoes. Really? To this day, right now, yeah. Was that? Do you think that was like one of the hardest adjustments coming out? Yeah, it's like, I could. It's it's a lot. Like, I still wake up early. Like, I wake up five, six o'clock, waiting for like it's like the door's gonna pop. <laughs> yeah. Do you, what's like the terminology be t- <laughs> behind like being institutionalized? Like, do you feel like you are in a sense like after doing ten years on a certain routine? Has that carried over? I know I'm institutionalized. There ain't no question about it. I know it's certain things like. If a person is too close to me, I'm automatically like in defense mode, ready to, you know what I'm saying? And that's how I know I'm institutionalized because yeah. this is the real world. People don't even think they're doing no harm to you. Like not wanting to be touched or anything like that. Like Walmart, people uh, hit your cart or hit you on accident and don't say nothing and just keep it moving. And then the Fed and the Pen, if they ain't say sorry or nothing like that, you probably would have stabbed that person. You get what I'm saying? So, yeah. Yeah, it's like the respect. So what, what year do you get out? I just got out last year. You got out. 2022, excuse me. 2022. Mm-hmm. What, was, what do you think was like the biggest change in the real world and, and the free world from when you went in? My biggest change was the like, I had to start getting used to really being around people, like being around people again. Like, it's like something in jail. Like, I don't know. It's like, I felt, I, I, I was going so long that I started feeling like, comfortable in jail. Can you understand what I'm saying with that? Yeah. Like being around the people I was around, all that. It's like I was comfortable. It's like when I got out of jail, I was very uncomfortable around people. 
got very uncomfortable because it's like I don't know nobody no more. I feel like I knew people where I was at. I don't know nobody no more. I don't know nobody no more. Yeah. Yeah, I was like scared to trust people because I didn't know. You know what I'm saying? It's just so much stuff going on. I just. Do you heal from that over time? Like, what's how's your mindset shifted in just like the past year? Oh, uh, well, the past years, it, yeah, it's like from when I came home to now, it's like I trust more, but I still move a certain way. Like, I don't like going out and being socially involved with everybody. And I don't know, I just, I don't like to do stuff like that. Stuff like that makes me feel congested. Like I'm just stuck somewhere. I don't, I don't like that feeling. Are you cautious now of who you spend your time with too? Yeah. Do you have a better sense of like your value of time and freedom and and, and that? The people I surround myself around. Keeping your peace and, and finding your peace? I protect my peace at all costs. I think when you lose your peace, like you get into a scary spot. Like when you're in prison, you don't really have that peace. And when you get out, you know, certain things can trigger not having your peace and you have to protect it. Like that's something I'm working through myself. Like as I navigate certain situations, I'm really realizing like the value of keeping my peace and other how easily others can affect that. And I want to be in control of that and not lose that. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely like it's I'm very cautious about that and, and who I let into my circle. Because we don't want to, no one wants to lose their peace. Mm. The the peace is like one of the most important things you have. Right. So what about your relationship with your kid after 10 years? Does he look at you differently? Are you guys having conversations? Yeah, I, I talk to my son every day. My, me and him, like, it, it's, it's crazy because he loved me so much. Like, I've been with him every day. Like, I never left him. Like, that's how he act. Like, Are you making sure he doesn't go down the same path you traveled? Of course. Like, and I love, like, he wants to be an eye surgeon, so. A I'm, what? A, a eye surgeon. Eye What's, surgeon, yeah, really? He wants hmm. to be an eye surgeon, so I'd be really big on him about those things, so I'll, like, Google stuff about eye surgeons and stuff like that, and I'll quiz him. You know what I'm saying? Like, ask him stuff about it, and if he don't know it, then I'll teach him about it, because I know that's what you want to do. You know what I'm saying? So I'm big for what you want to do. Yeah. Before your path spiraled out of control, what were your aspirations? Like, what were your dreams as a child growing up? I wanted to go to the NBA. You wanted to go to the NBA? Mm -hmm. And and you, you were, that was in your heart that you wanted to do it? I used to love basketball, but I just was too much into the streets. I used to let the streets control me. I did, I just didn't even care about even getting too far into it, but I used to be real good at basketball. Do you ever think about that? Those early days, like the childhood, like I'll be with my friends and I'll reminisce about like the good days, middle school, high school. Like I do that all the time. Before things went bad. Like, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the music. I don't know what it is, but you just can't have a good time no more. Yeah, I'll be driving. And I'll just remember those days and they're like happy times and I'll smile. I'm like, wow, man, like life was just so much simpler. Like they just said, mm -hmm. for the 4th of July, Back in the day, 4th of July, I used to be able to go to a cookout. Yeah. Now, 4th of July, you got to ask who's having a cookout. That's crazy. <laughs> now, you were saying that in prison, your mindset was still the same way before you got into prison, like that, you know, getting into trouble, that aspect. When did it change when you got out? And why did it change? Shoot, because I know that if I do anything, that I'm going to go back for a long time. And I'm definitely not going back to jail, period. I just don't want to go. Jail wasn't a lifestyle that I really liked. It was a, I had to do it type of thing. Do I want to do it again? No. Do you think if you had gotten, if you got that original five years, would you have the same mindset you do now? No. So I probably you, would have been back in jail already. You needed that 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's crazy to think about. It saved me. It saved you, yeah. And what, what do you do now for work? Like right now, me, I'm on like flipping houses and stuff like that. So I got my own, but I rap. So I kind of make a little bit of money for my rapping and stuff like that. And I'm just trying to put it towards flipping houses and making generation more, just generating money so I could just put more into my music until finally something happened. Or, you know, I'd just be a landlord, uh, start trucking companies, whatever I can do with my money. Just I want different avenues. Is that your what you're passionate about? I'm passionate about my music, but I love just entrepreneurship. I love it. Like, I, I, I don't know, something Not about like being that. a businessman, I just love it. Yeah, do you feel like that was, like, your purpose, your calling? Like, everything brought you to this to do that? Man, before I even went to jail, I was, when I was selling drugs, I was thinking about getting my drug money and open up a laundromat. Didn't even know why, but I just wanted a laundromat. Like, I already had the game plan. I can't do illegal things for too long. Like, yeah, go to jail. 
That I mean, that's good. That I think it's helpful for people to know that, like that you've you've gone through the shit, you caused all that trouble in prison, you went through it, the worst of the worst, and you're you're out, and you have that clear mindset that you're not going back. Mm. Like this is who I am now, mm-hmm. and I think that's great. Like that's a great message. Now, knowing everything you know now, and you went back to your 19 year old self, and you sat down with him. What do you say to that 19 year old self? I tell him, do not clout chase you do not have to do none of the things that you're going to want to do you do not have to do them just go home to your son go home <laughs> just go home man that's all i should have told, told myself just go home do your bid now are you talking about my 19 self before while i was about to have to go to prison or just no before before, before you oh. went to prison yeah everything oh just... i would have told him bro it's a thing called bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> it's um, gonna be super big when you see it buy up all the shares that's what i told myself. yeah i actually got an offer to buy bitcoin in 2013 and oh. i should have but i think about that too i'm like well you know as soon as it made 10 grand i would have cashed it out so it never would have seen the billions it would have yeah. been worth anyways because when you see a little bit of growth you, you just have you like oh i'll take that. yeah that's like at the casino you know and you keep pressing it until you until you lose it and you're done What's the next like five years look like for you? Are you are you planning into the future? Are you thinking about what's next for you? Yeah, I'm gonna be. I feel like I'm gonna be a multimillionaire within the next five years. I think within the next two years. That's how I feel. I'm putting a lot of ground, a lot of work right now. And how do you get back? Like, how do you how do you make peace with like some of the actions you've done like in the past? What's your plan to like get back to the world? Because money and stuff is great. Money, power, and all that. Yeah, like I want it. Like me, I'm big on homeless. I don't like homeless people. Like, I don't like seeing people homeless like that. I don't know something about me. Every time I see homeless people, if I got it, I'm going to give them money. Mm. Because I could be there. I could be in a situation. I just feel like it's so much people with all this money. They could come through, come together and at least get like an apartment complex and let, and, and house the homeless people. Yeah. And y'all buy all these apartment complexes, but y'all can't put none of these homeless people up. And just pay, and just, come on, it's not that hard. Uh, let them do whatever they do in their house. That's on them. But at least put, put give them somewhere to live. Do you also ever think about um, the people that were close in your life and how that affected them doing those ten years with you? Mm-hmm. Do you do, do you think about that and, and their feelings and emotions? Of course. How does that make you feel? It, it really, I I really feel like bad for myself because I was putting them through a lot of stuff. I used to just call and lie about stuff I'm about to do just so I could get some K two. You know, and I really might have probably went and did the stuff I was about to go do just because they thought I was playing around. I mean, your poor mother, you're probably telling her to do yeah. stuff and she's like, what is he getting into? And like, they're out. Of, I know how I made my yeah. dad feel when I'd call him for stuff. I so. used to make my mom cry for real. And it hurt, that hurt me like so much because it was the drug. The drug was so addictive. And I felt like if I didn't smoke at that time, like I, like I said, I'm going to do something. Yeah. Wow. Just off of a little attitude or somebody rubbed me the wrong way. Oh, I'm about to stab him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was smoking K2 heavy to keep myself calm. Michael, thank you for coming on the show, man. This yeah. has been great. A great conversation. No, thank you. Yeah, definitely like different. Uh, it was really interesting diving into like the prison stuff um, on the penitentiary level and, and hearing your experience, man. And I hope you reach those goals that you want to get and, and you stay on that path, man, and Thank keep you. doing your thing. And I'll we'll be sure to check out your music. Yeah. You want me back? Bring me back. <laughs> Where could uh, people find you at? Uh, you can find me on everything. YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, what's it now? Um, <laughs> TikTok. Yeah, what's, yeah, all of it. Broad Day Boom. The real Broad Day Boom. Just type in Broad Day Boom. You're going to see me light skin, dread, dreads, <laughs> tattoos. You're going to know who I am. Man. Cool. Yeah, we're going to put all your information in, your, in, in the bio of the episode and, and people will definitely check you out, man. Mm-hmm. Check me out on uh, Spotify, <laughs> all of that. The real Broad Day Boom. Type in really federal. My EP is up there. What's the best song you, you would recommend for a first time listener? Uh, I'm going to tell you, go listen to Napkin. Napkin is a very good song. I love Napkin on that EP. Napkin, you're going to like Napkin. That's a very good song. Awesome, man. Thanks for coming on the show and uh, safe travels back. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.